Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. We are going to give it a few more minutes before we get started so that we make sure everybody has time to get in and doesn't miss anything. So hang on for another minute or two and we'll be right back. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is Nathan Lee here at Ritchie May. Uh, it's good to be with you all. Thanks for joining us for today's quarterly trend series webinar. Um, from wherever you are, there's certainly plenty going on in the mortgage industry these days, and uh, the Fed just just made its announcement of a 75 basis point increase. So, um, should make for another interesting day in the mortgage industry. It's been an interesting week for sure. Um, you know, challenging as most weeks have been here this year. And so we appreciate those of you that are carving time out of your day to spend a little bit of it with us um, as we share some of what we hope to be valuable insights with you guys. Um, we started this quarterly trend series webinar now, now a couple of years ago and uh, always try to come up with timely, relevant, valuable topics and information to share with our clients and others in the industry. And um, today we have a, a couple of great presenters that we're, that we're excited about and uh, have some contact content that um, hopefully you'll find relevant and timely as we share some, some updated uh, benchmarking information here uh, with first quarter data and then present some some strategies and um, ideas that uh, that hopefully will be beneficial to you. So just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, everybody is on mute. Um, if you have some questions throughout the webinar, uh, go ahead and drop them in the chat feature of the of the app. Uh, that way, the presenters will all see those as they come in. We can address some of them as we're going. Others we 
we will likely save to the end and hopefully we can get to all of them but if we don't we'll follow up with you individually and respond to any questions that you submit today um the the session is being recorded and we'll send out a recording of today's session and slides uh, to everyone afterwards so look for that here over the next couple of days um, so just by way of, of introduction for those of you on here that may not be familiar with Richie May are working with us already um, Richie May has been involved in the mortgage industry for over 30 years and uh, we provide accounting uh, financial statement audit tax compliance tax consulting services and then a variety of advisory services around compliance uh, around technology and um, including things like business intelligence data analytics automation cybersecurity, and we serve about probably more than 275 or so companies around the country so we we see a lot we have a lot of data and information we we see what companies do well and, and some of the mistakes that are made. And we, we really just try to leverage uh, the things that we learn as we work with those clients to, uh, to help our clients and add value to them. And so a couple of our, our presenters today, as you can see on the screen here, are, um, are Seth Sprague and Olivia Nicholson. First will be Olivia. And uh, Olivia leads our business intelligence and data analytics practice here at Richie May. And uh, she's spent more than 10 years, I think, at this point, Olivia in the mortgage industry, and uh, has been in data analytics and business intelligence really that entire time. She leads our team here, and that team serves our clients' uh, data needs across bench, benchmarking, financial benchmarking, compensation studies, and then also business intelligence and they support a platform that many of our clients use to provide uh, business intelligence information to help them run their businesses uh, and then seth sprague um, many of you probably know but for those of you that don't seth, seth is a long time mortgage industry uh, participant expert uh, speaker consultant he leads our mortgage banking consulting practice here at the firm he joined Richie May just within the last couple months and uh, Seth started his career as as an accountant at KPMG one of the big four maybe big six at the time and um, and has spent time at SunTrust uh, Phoenix Capital and Stratmore who's been with us here for a couple months so we're excited about we're excited to hear them and um, and uh, Hope that you guys will enjoy it. And again, as I said, if you have any questions, drop them in the chat and we'll field them either as we go or at the end. So with that, I'll hand it over to Olivia. Great. Well, thanks, Nathan. Um, and thanks, you know, everyone for logging on, spending some time with us today. Um, I promise my feelings will not be hurt that I know a lot of you are here to hear what Seth has today, but I appreciate you you know, taking a little time with me first as I go through some of the production and financial trends that we're seeing in the industry lately. Um, so like Nathan said, I'm Olivia. I'm the Director of Business Intelligence and Data Analytics here at Richie May. I'm going to be showing you some reporting today from our Richie May Select Benchmarking Program. Um, I'm going to be going over trends that we saw in the data as of the close of Q1 of this year. And then obviously we're wrapping up Q2 now, so we'll be able to have that data ready for you shortly after the quarter closes. So all of the data I'm showing you today comes from Richie May Select. Um, like Nathan said, that's our financial benchmarking program. We have over 80, almost 90 IMB participants, and each participant is submitting their quarterly financial data and is able to see that in comparison to their peers. So a variety of peer groups based on channel mixes, um, sizes, even some customized peer group, maybe based on geography. So a lot of opportunity there to do a deep dive into what your financial performance looks like and how that stacks up in the industry. So pulling all that data together, um, I put together some reports today to give you an idea of where we're at. First off, I'm gonna be showing you some origination trends, which I'm sure there's no surprise here. You know, it's continued to be a big drop in total production each quarter. I'm also gonna to touch on some trends we're seeing in different product types as well. 
On the finance side, I'll go over kind of overall net income figures we're seeing. And the big headline on this one this quarter was that our net production income number, which I'll define here in a couple of minutes, that moved into negative territory this quarter. So not uh, necessarily great news there. Um, and then this was obviously driven by a big drop in overall margins, coupled with historical highs in cost to originate. Um, so I'm going to also show you a little bit more detail on each of those as well. So starting with our origination figures, um, just to clarify here, all of the data I'm showing you today is our entire Richie May select population. So you can see what this looks like in total. Um, these are really just averages coming from a different mix of lenders, um, but really just intended to show you a trend here. And for this report you're looking at, I'm showing you a view of the last five years. Um, so back to near the beginning of 2017, so you can kind of see that five-year comparison. So Q1 2022 volume dropped 24% quarter over quarter. Um, in terms of total dollars, this was obviously the largest quarterly drop we've ever seen, but in terms of that percentage drop, um, this was the largest since 2017, which you can see here on this chart. Um, but obviously we were dealing with much smaller kind of absolute value numbers there. Uh, I would say if there's any good news here, we're still this past quarter at a quarterly high when we look back historical at any pre-2020 quarters. But as you can see, we're starting to get really close to those levels that we were seeing back in 2019. Um, so with another quarter like we've had, uh, and it seems like we're going to have that quarter, you know, as Q2 closes, we're definitely going to be completely out of those historical highs and kind of lost all of that momentum that we had for the last two years. And then the last piece here on production, you can see those green versus blue bars here on my chart. Um, you can see that the refi share dropped. It came to about 30% this quarter, but it was previously at 33% last quarter, so not too much of a change. Um, and this is obviously down from our high of 57% refinance volume in 2020. So definitely we'll have to see what happens there uh, with rates. Also moving into what should be a purchase market, but as you'll hear from Seth, that's not necessarily the case. So we'll kind of see what happens with that refi versus purchase share here. Last piece I want to uh, touch on here on the origination side is uh, arm production and kind of what the trends look like there. So you can see in this chart, which goes again back to the beginning of 2017, ARMS made up about 2% of total production for our IMD participants this last quarter. And this is up from the all-time low that you can see was 0.6% in Q4 of 2020. Um, but we're still ways off of the highs that we saw in 2018 that you can see here on this chart. So another trend you know, to keep an eye on as we're thinking about rates changing, kind of general market conditions, what options are available to borrowers, um, and then also what makes the most sense for lenders here as well. So that's what production looks like. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get into some of the financials now. The first one I'll spend some time on is net production income and comparing that to our income statement or kind of gap net income figure. So just a quick refresher, you know, from last quarter or for those of you who don't participate in Richie May Select and haven't heard me talk about it before, the different benchmarking reports that we provide, some of them um, are net production income, servicing income, and then our gap net income report. And really the difference with net production income compared to that gap net income number is that uh, the net production income figure is intended to show just the profitability of your origination platform. So that's important here to get to an apples to apples origination comparison. Uh, we're doing this by excluding any servicing income expenses or adjustments. Um, another piece we exclude is the unfunded lock pipeline and any of the unrealized gains associated with that lock pipeline just to smooth out some of those differences quarter to quarter. Um, we're also removing loan loss reserves from our net production income number, as well as any outside activity not related to origination. So something like renting out a building that might generate income, um, any outside investments, anything like that. So that's one side, you have net production income, and the other is our gap net income, which is basically what you would see on your audited income statement, which obviously includes all of those line items I just detailed that we are excluding from the net production income number. So that's just an important note, um, you know, in this report, but also when you're looking at any benchmarking metrics from any source or kind of reading headlines about the financials in the industry, definitely be paying attention to what is actually included or excluded in that number. Again, just to make sure you're getting that apples to apples comparison when you're trying to compare that to your own metrics. 
So looking at this graph, just so you can kind of get your bearings here, um, the net production income number, so that final number just related to origination profitability, that's the green bars that you see here on this chart. And then the gap net income number is the blue line that I have overlaid here. And I'm showing this report back to the beginning of 2012. Um, so a little bit longer view than those production reports that I was showing. Um, 2012 was actually when we started collecting this benchmarking data. So I just wanted to give you everything we have so you can kind of see where we stand in more of a historical context here. So as you can see, our net production income number took a big hit this past quarter. It dropped 77 basis points, which was a 141% drop from Q4 of 2021. This is also a 216 basis point drop from the all-time high that we saw in Q3 of 2020. And as you can see from this chart here, um, this is only the fifth time in the last 10 years, so the entire program's history, that we saw a negative number for this average net production income figure. And just to put a little bit more context around it, um, when we're looking at the margins between you know, your gain on sale plus origination fees compared to those costs per loan, we saw an average 9% deficit in break-even volume. So this past quarter, we would have needed 9% more closed volume just to get us to break even if we're looking at just origination activity here. So that being said, on the other side of this, um, we have our gap net income numbers, so that blue line there again, where we get to add back in all of our servicing activity, unrealized gains on our open lock pipeline, uh, loan loss reserves, all of those kind of additional figures in there. So this number was actually up this quarter from last quarter. It came out to about 60 basis points on average, which is an 80 basis point gap between that net production income and your financial statement net income. So you can see on this chart, the difference between um, those green bars and the blue lines, that's the difference between those two net income figures. So kind of adding back in anything that's not that core mortgage origination profitability. Um, this was one of the largest gaps that we've ever seen between those two figures. The other one that you can see that was the only one really even close here was in Q2 of 2020. Um, and that gap back, back in 2020 was obviously really primarily due to the unrealized gains on IRLCs. But this quarter, it was definitely more heavily weighted towards servicing profitability and some of those MSR adjustments that um, you know, servicers had the benefit of this past quarter. So that's where we're at in terms of kind of total net income here. I'll get into some of the numbers behind those. Um, first off, secondary gain on sale. So obviously, you know, kind of playing the biggest role here in terms of that net production income number. Just another reminder here on this gain on sale, we're looking at averages across all different lenders, different channels, different sizes. Um, and we're also excluding that um, unfunded lock pipeline, any of your unrealized gains there. So keep that in mind if you're comparing to any of your own numbers. So a big drop here in that gain on sale, as you can see this past quarter, um, those average, average margins took a hit as expected. They dropped 44 basis points over the quarter, which was a 13% drop. And this was the second highest quarterly drop that we've ever seen. Um, the highest being what you can see happened obviously in Q1 of last year. So this drop last quarter brings us in line with historical lows. You can see on this chart, um, there's only one quarter below the numbers that we saw this past quarter, and that was all the way back in 2013. So that's unfortunately where we stand um, on the revenue side, and we have the same sort of story on the expense side as well. Um, I'm showing you here total cost to originate figure on a dollars per loan basis. So simple calculation here, just any expenses that would show up on your financial statements, but excluding anything related to servicing here, so just kind of cost to originate, and then dividing that by the number of closed loans in the period. So those costs went up again this quarter on a per loan basis. Um, you can see that's the seventh quarter in a row, um, and they went up both in personnel expenses and kind of total overhead operational costs. All in, um, these costs are at about $11,500 per loan, which was a $1,300 or 13% increase from last quarter. Um, these costs increased across all departments on the personnel side. You can see here, sales was up 2% per loan, fulfillment up 12%, and back office up 28%. And then we also saw increases in every operational overhead expense grouping that we break out, and that came out to a total of 22% increases um, in that overhead operational expense per loan. 
So looking at some pretty hefty increases on the cost side on a per loan basis, um, obviously not surprising when you kind of put the full picture together, understanding that break even deficit, uh, volume being down over the quarter and kind of understanding how that shakes out in terms of your overall cost per loan. So that closes us out for the benchmarking data and some of the trends uh, that we're seeing from a production and a financial standpoint. So with that, I am going to go ahead and hand it over to Seth. All right. Thanks, Olivia. And full disclosure, I just tuned into this webinar to hear Olivia's data and her slides. So, um, you know, I'm not going to say anything. We should just ask Olivia a bunch of questions, I think, about performance and where it's going to go in Q2. Um, I'm going to cover a couple of topics here. I've been at Richie May now, but uh, I think it's about five or six weeks. Um, great to be part of the team here. Happy to be um, uh, interacting a lot with uh, folks. Uh, a few folks are texting me. A few folks will uh, will just probably dial in and make sure I got a haircut. Um, folks haven't seen me for a while. But it's great to be part of the team here and happy to be uh, kind of covering some material. I, I think from the standpoint of where we're going to go on this presentation, um, we're going to leave a lot of time for Q&A at the end because there, there's probably some topics that we're not going to cover that people want to talk about. Um, and certainly people may want to dive uh, deeper into some of that great data that Olivia presented. Um, it's hard to follow. Um, and I was making notes here. It's hard to follow um, record record costs, uh, record drops and margins. Uh, usually I'm known as Dr. Doom in the industry. So maybe um, uh, maybe I won't be Dr. Doom on this call. Maybe I'll be the bright light here. Um, so servicing, so well, let's just start with the service first slide here. We go to slide 13, the summer purchase market with a question mark. Um, and we're gonna ask a poll question here. Uh, so we're gonna turn it over to our marketing team here to kind of kick open a poll question for you. Um, oh, I don't get to vote, darn it. Um, anyway, the, the quick poll question here is, are you reforecasting originations and profitability for the remainder of 2022? Um, and the, we didn't, we, we'll only ask this as a yes or no question. The full disclosure here is that we should probably ask how many times have you re or many, how many times have you already reforecasted originations this year? Uh, because it seems like every week or every day, uh, the CFOs uh, and the, the financial folks are having to sort of reforecast numbers uh, for the second half of the year as, as we sort of hit um, unprecedented times here in it when it comes to both uh, the volatility of rates, uh, the change in par mortgage rates, and just kind of the change in your business practices on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, quick poll question just to see if you have had to reforecast or in process of reforecasting. And we won't ask how many times you've reforecasted uh, because the uh, answer is probably uh, multiple times. So the results are uh, 83, hey, it's 80-20. It's always 80-20. Um, but, you know, I guess for those that haven't been, haven't had to reforecast, I, I hate to tell you, but uh, a reforecast is probably coming your way based on uh, sort of that base point rate move by the Fed today and rates over the last couple of days are certainly going to cause a lot of stress in that um, side of the space. So we go to the next slide, uh, Olivia, on slide 14, and let's talk about some of the data that's out there. and. You know, uh, we all have our different sources of data. Um, I, I tend to steal stuff from these Compass Point uh, folks in DC. They, they have the same data, but this, the uh, blue line here, the kind of the heavier blue line is purchase applications in 2022 versus 2021. And um, sad, sadly, the, uh, the, we, we are having a gap here. Um, I know the MBA is reforecasted several times. They do a great job with their forecast. I think the issue that people are generally seeing is that one, we suffered from a lack of inventory at the beginning of the year on the purchase side. So inventories are rough. And now with the spike in mortgage rates, affordability is becoming a play for both sides. Um, Fannie Mae sentiment is those millennial buyers aren't that interested in buying a house right now. Um, and so I think as you kind of as we kind of look towards the second half of this year, it'll be it'll be fascinating to see if the purchase volume picks back up. We probably need a little bit of help in rates. Um, it's hard to say with the Fed moving rates today is that going to help or hurt mortgage rates. I guess my initial reaction is that the Fed only moving 75 basis points probably doesn't change the market perception. 
that inflation needs to be controlled a little bit better. Um, if, if I had a vote with the Fed, I would have done 100 today, but uh, they didn't ask me. So purchase apps, we're struggling along, limping along. The anomaly here is obviously 2020, where the back half of the year post COVID was, was a really active period for refinances. But if we go to the next slide, we're really not seeing the summer bump up um, that we've traditionally seen. And as I've talked to clients and talked to folks in the industry, you know, th there's a number of reasons the, that, that people talk about. Um, actual inflation numbers is certainly a driver, but, you know, volatility in the equities market, you know, what's happening in the jumbo space? Um, are people thinking this is a good time to move? You know, housing values. Most of the markets are at all time highs. Um, it doesn't mean that they're, that we're in for a housing recession, but I do think that there's some significant risk there as people think about housing values um, in terms of inflation. I put this bullet in here, uh, the great re-migration for post Labor Day work. Um, as I've been out in the field with folks, um, kind of increasingly post Labor Day sounds like the date that most people have certain, uh, circled to get people back into the office. I think the question to ask is, are they even available to get back to the office? Where do they currently live? Did they migrate away? Um, are people gonna try to migrate back? Are they gonna try to get on planes? Um, how are they gonna get back to the office in sort of this new hybrid work model? Um, I, I, I think there's gonna be some interesting trends here. And, and again, uh, I know everyone's, tired of hearing unprecedented and uncharted waters. But I do think that there's going to be some activity um, potentially around people changing jobs, looking for new jobs um, as they're kind of, I'm gonna say, quote, forced back into the office for a period of time for, for a couple of days a week because I think people have moved. So we'll see what happens there. You know, the unemployment, the employment numbers or unemployment numbers are, are good, uh, but, Boy, you can't uh, read anything and talk and, and hear about recession. And mindset of the consumer, I think, is something that as, as a mortgage space and, and certainly sometimes with prepayment models and servicing, we don't always think about. But if the mindset of the consumer becomes let's hunker down um, and not do much, that will create a recession just by consumer spending. If you looked at retail sales in May, they were off. Now, gasoline was up, but retail sales were down. So already the consumer behavior is starting to be impacted. And I think that's gonna have an impact on our housing market for the rest of this year. And then, uh, then of course, there's the, those expected inflation numbers. Um, you know, the shocker last week was those in, 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 the inflation numbers came out much higher than people were hoping. We were hoping for a downward trend at this point. And then the final risk, of course, the summer risk is inflation. Um, everything's just costing more. Uh, so we only said inflation three times here, but I, I think the overall consumer sentiment is something that the mortgage industry needs to be aware of. I've been talking to clients about potentially, you know, modeling delinquencies. And um, I, I know that uh, Marina Walsh from the MBA may be on here and she's got some awesome data on delinquencies and on um, overall mortgage delinquencies. But you know, is that trend going to hold for the rest of this year? Because we have really strong employment. We have a good job situation, but we might have a spike here in delinquency. So again, we may be in, in situations where our historical data may not be as strong or as correlated as we would expect going forward. So right now, the summer activity is not looking as strong as we had hoped. We will see what picks up here over the next couple of weeks, but we already are in mid-June. Um, and we should be in the peak of applications. Now I know applications are up week over week, uh, so that's a good trend, but they're still down year over year. So if we go to the next slide here, and as we as we talk about uh, the mortgage rates, and this is the, the the this is the joke slide. It doesn't matter how frequent you pull rates or when you look at rates, um, they're always probably going to be higher than whatever data you've just pulled. You know. This week, we seem to have touched 6% mortgages out there. Um, if you've talked to capital markets people, the problem with 6% mortgages is there really isn't a tradable TBA or a liquid TBA to get those loans into. And we're also in a situation where we have increased LLPAs, 
compared to last time when we've been through cycles like this. So the market and the and the environment has changed. You know, LTV is now a, a blatant adjustment in those in those grids from from Fannie and Freddie. So are you seeing, um, you know, higher mortgage rates? That is really just a reflection of LLPAs, but. Mortgage rates may or may not have touched six yesterday. They may or may not be touching six today. I think it is somewhat dependent on where you have your hedges and where you're putting mortgage rates. But um, you know, this is just a week old data and we're already well through these numbers. Um, I think the rate movement was way more sudden and expected. And I kind of say this in the nicest way. 2022 is starting to be the manifestation of what we thought 2020 would look like except in 2020, we had this little problem called COVID, which really caused mortgage rates to decline. And it's hard to remember two years ago, or now almost two and a half years ago, but the thought process in 2020 was that rates would rise, they'd kind of rise steadily, and we'd sort of hit this four or 5% mortgage by 2022, 2023. Well, all we did was really just delay that by about two years. And that rate movement, instead of being sort of a slow, rate movement has been a sudden snap up in rates. Um, I used to call this the rubber band effect of the, of the government influences on easy money, but when that rubber band snaps, it's very painful. And we're certainly experiencing that right now as the data that Olivia presented for Q1 and probably what Q2 will look like. If we go to the next slide here on the purchase side, uh, we have a quick servicing retention pull question. And the question um, here is, are you currently retaining servicing? Um, and again, just a, a simple yes or no question. So uh, we're you know, almost halfway through the presentation and now we're gonna do a little bit about servicing because you know I have to talk about servicing at some point, otherwise um, you know, I get fined by uh, people for not talking about servicing. So you know, the trend on servicing, as we saw with CARES Act and COVID, was that people had had the ability to deliver to the agencies, started to deliver more loans. And through 2021, despite the fact that margins were starting to come down the second half of that year, uh, people were still retaining servicing. Uh, you know, the value of that customer, the long-term value of that customer relationship is something that people valued. And so, the, 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 I think the traditional thought process was that people would stop retaining servicing as soon as they could. Uh, but hey, I thought it'd be 50-50. So almost 65% of you are retaining servicing. And, and you know, uh, so it's about two thirds. Uh, everyone knows that my public math skills are, are questionable at best. So about two thirds of you are retaining servicing and a third of you are not. For those that are not, you may be experiencing some choppiness and some volatility around the servicing values. And I say this in the nicest way, but when you start delivering high fives or 6% handle MSRs through either a correspondent channel or a co-issue execution, you have to remember that, that there is a large population of folks to think that mortgage rates might be a little artificially high and that there might be a little more refinance incentive in some of this more recent vintage product that's being created. And if, there, if people don't believe that, if they hedge the MSR asset, it certainly has become much more expensive to hedge the MSR asset. And that's gonna cause servicing values, at least on the newer production to bobble down a little bit, or at least be capped out in some ways. So, as the folks on the CITUS call said about an hour and a half ago, volatility is rarely good for the servicing asset and is rarely good for mortgages. And we're certainly experiencing that sort of in spades here across the industry at this time. So if we go to the next slide, one of the topics that I wanted to kind of address today, um, and our marketing folks came up with this term, uh, and, and I you know, like to change the English language where I can, but the treating the MSR gaposis. If we go to the next slide, I'm gonna to try to explain to you what the gaposis is. And the question for those two thirds of the folks that are actually retaining servicing are, are you actually achieving the cash flows that are embedded in your MSR valuations? Or is there a gap between those cash flows that are supporting the fair value of your MSRs and the actual cash flows? And not to bury the lead here, we could go to the next slide, but the answer is yes. And the answer is, more importantly, how big is that gap? 
And the fact that there's a gap today is not a new gap. This gap has always been present, um, but I would say that the gap today might be wider in some instances than people have traditionally thought of it. So if you hold servicing and you get those MSR valuations, and we, we might be publishing here, or we will be publishing shortly, a little bit of a snippet of a, a, an article that I wrote about um, kind of ways to think about this gap. You know, what's the accuracy of the repayment speeds? What's your actual servicing costs? Uh, I know that those were at, were at the MBA Accounting and Finance Conference. Um, and I, I mentioned the fact that if you haven't checked your subservicing contracts recently, you might want to check them uh, because your, your CPI inflation factor is, uh, for servicing costs is probably CPI times 1.5. So your servicing costs from your subservicer are probably going up. Your internal servicing costs are going up. And more importantly, if you're using a subservicer or you're a non-depository, what are the cash flows that you actually earn and what is your subservicer earning? And this is not a, I'm picking on subservicers and I'm, pick, I'm, I'm saying you should retain servicing and you should keep it in house as a servicing platform. But embedded in those fair value valuations are probably escrow earnings, a marginal cost to service, late fee and ancillary income, which might be increasing here as we go through potentially a higher level of delinquencies due to the overall inflation and in, in economy. And so what are you actually earning in those cash flows? And so if we go to the next slide here, the difference is what do you do about this gap and managing this gap osis? And so if you go to the next slide, I think the first thing that you need to do is measure it, right? You need to identify the gap and what is the size of the gap, quantify it, and is it specific to certain investors? Is it certain to certain states? Is it certain to different, um, all sorts of metrics that can kind of drive that gap in those cash flows. And as you look at that gap, you have to then spin the Rubik's Cube here and go, well, what's your most pressing issue, right? Is it immediate cash? Looking at the data that Olivia presented, I'm guessing that cash, and cash needs may trump the long-term value of the customer or that potential fee income for the future, right? So I need to cover my costs. Costs are up on the origination side. We're all going through a process of right-sizing our origination side of the business. But are we thinking about how ways to grow revenue? And are we thinking about ways to potentially reduce long-term risk? And I say that in the nicest way, we probably have some non-QM shops on the call. We probably have some folks that are doing non-QM mortgages. But I just want to arc back to the last time we had sort of a, a sharp uh, increase in mortgage rates. The industry adopted, um, I'm going to say, some new and innovative underwriting practices in the 2004 to 2008 window. And I say that for those that haven't been through cycles like this, but by new and innovative underwriting, I mean, we didn't underwrite loans for the most part. And those were all banks that mostly participated in what was known as Alt-A servicing at that time. Well, Alt-A doesn't really exist anymore. We have, now we have non-QM mortgages, right? Well, are banks dominating the origination cycle? No, the data suggests that non-depositories or IMBs are dominating the cycle. So if you're gonna create sort of a product that isn't agency eligible, you have to make sure that the investors are liquid and you have a good source to sell those loans. And I just throw this as a cautionary tale for somebody that uh, may or may not have originated option R loans. And we had four investors lined up and all four investors went bankrupt in the same 30 days that all of a sudden a bank, which was doing option arms, all of a sudden would end up with those in portfolio. Well, the big risk to me outside of the gap of the servicing side is the fact that we might be chasing revenue and we might be chasing product here that may not be sustainable long-term or create illiquidity events for you, particularly if you don't have a fortress balance sheet to put them on. So again, what is your most pressing need? Is it cash? Is it fee income? Is it stored value for the company? Is it loan officer retention and recruiting? And I think you want to kind of spin the cube here and look at what your most pressing need is 
and also look at the gap in the cash flows. And Olivia, if we go to the next slide, the our, our kind of strategy here and where I'm trying to help folks out uh, underneath the Richie May umbrella is, look, one strategy does not fit all companies, right? It depends on your situation. Your situation may be cash flush. Your situation may be you need cash. Your situation may be you're bringing servicing in-house. You might be bringing servicing to a subservicer. You might be looking at bringing on additional investors, retaining different services. So you have to really understand the, that alignment of your short-term needs and your long-term strategy. And I realize it's easy as a consultant to say, hey, we, you know, we really need to focus in on that long-term strategy because you know, there'll be another cycle of rates here and there'll be a refinance and we won't be at these levels forever. And you're thinking, I got to survive the next 30 and 60 and 90 days, Seth, before I get to that long-term strategy. But the word of caution here is don't sacrifice necessarily that complete long-term strategy for those short-term needs. You need to balance both. You may have value represented in your MSRs that's not supported by the actual servicing cash flows you are earning. Does that mean you should sell servicing? Not necessarily. It doesn't necessarily mean you should do anything with it other than try to identify what those gaps are. Think about that in terms of what other factors can I potentially close that gap with? And maybe there's a transaction that you need to do. Maybe there's a transaction that you not don't need to do, but you certainly need to be understanding what that gap is in the, the value, the cash flows that are supporting that fair value and the cash flows you're actually, under, you're actually achieving. And then if you're going to execute a strategy, and, and again, the folks in size just did their a monthly call about two hours ago, but it's really understanding the state of the MSR market. The market's been incredibly active so far this year. There's been a lot of deals brought to market, but is it is that fair value that's on your balance sheet a true tradable level? And the answer is yes, no, and maybe, right? You hope the answer is yes, but if the top bidders aren't there, there's a gap between the top MSR bidders and then the next pack level of pack bidders, as Sinus would say. And so I think you want to think about timing of the market and transactions. And I hate to say it, but we're already sitting here kind of in the middle of June, where we may have a nuclear winter here when it comes to production over the next couple of weeks until no rates kind of normalize and stabilize and people get comfortable. But at the end of the day, that servicing value and those cash flows that you're experiencing they may not be supported by a trade. They may be supported by a trade, but they may not be. And, and understanding that difference and how to help manage that gap is really, I think, one of the critical elements as to somebody like me who's not invested in selling servicing, not invested in particularly valuing servicing, but trying to help people really understand the servicing cash flows, the risks it presents, and their overall strategy. When you see, you know, 141 base, uh, percent drop in the uh, overall profitability, you see increase of expenses. How are you going to manage through this cycle to get to and execute your long-term strategy is critical. So with that, I think we were supposed to have 15 minutes for questions and answers. And I think I'm giving us a solid 16 minutes, which I'm going to give myself a gold star for, for not running over today. So we're happy to turn it over to question and answer. Uh, please ask all the tough questions of Olivia. She's much smarter than I do and she has the data. Um, and then if, if the questions are really tough, we'll make Nathan answer them. So um, with that, I'll turn it back over to Nathan, I guess, for question and answers. If you do have any questions, the best way to ask them are through the chat bar rather than the questions bar. The chat bar gets to us a little bit faster and you can direct that to all presenters so that we can answer your questions even better. So make sure you put them in the chat box rather than that questions box. And Nathan, I think you're on mute. <laughs> Am 
about now? Can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Okay, okay. Um, you alluded to this, Seth, in your comments, but is are, are you seeing um, some pullback from buyers of MSRs right now? Is that is it softening? Uh, what, what's just kind of the how, how would you describe sort of just the the dynamic out there at the moment? Yeah, a great question. Um, and the article that we're going to publish, I think that will come out with the presentation here. We'll we'll kind of highlight this a little bit further. But I would say in general, the buyers are becoming a little bit more suspicious of their ability to um, earn the cash flows that they're expecting from servicing. And it sounds funny to say, to talk about prepayment speeds and voluntary prepayment speeds, et cetera, when you're thinking about 6% mortgage rates, but prepayment speeds quite haven't slowed as much as people have expected or models have expected. I mean, at this point in the cycle, when you've got 300 basis points of rate disincentive, I hate to say it, but I've only been in the space 27 years, and I don't think I've ever seen a portfolio that's been 300 basis points of rate disincentive. And I think the prepayment models, if they're left unchecked, might be producing um, sort of speeds that are kind of grounded in a regression or historical analysis that isn't present today. We have record home um, equity. And in, in, in an inflation market, and so are people tapping equity? And are they just going to say, whatever, I'm just going to get, I need to get equity. Um, is, is the home equity business going to come up? Or am I going to cash out refinance? How am I going to get that money? So I think the buyers are somewhat hitting pause a little bit. One, there's been so many deals. I think site has quoted, um, they've done double the number of deals already this year in terms of unpaid principal balance. They did it, that they did all of last year. And so there's a little bit of buyer fatigue. And, and I think the other piece that, that people just need to be aware of is that servicing transfers, and this sounds somewhat crazy, but if you were selling servicing in May, you know, with a May kind of sale date, you're probably transferring that servicing in September, October, or even November at this point. So servicing transfer windows are starting to get filled up just based on the volume of deals. And so for many of these buyers, if they can't control that customer and they can't control um, you know, that relationship sooner, they're gonna discount the servicing a little bit. And so I think the cash flows are just, people are just taking a little bit more suspicious eye. You know, and in the Ginny May space, I mean, we keep talking about it, but the FHA MIP that we all expect to happen any day now hasn't occurred. So if, if the MIP changes, the mortgage insurance premium drops, what does that cause to FHA values? And so I just think that those, the certainty of the cash flows, people are becoming a little less certain about them, which is causing them to not be as aggressive as they could be, or as the models might suggest in their bidding. Yeah. And that doesn't mean the Amazon market's bad. It just means you better time it correctly. Um, and there's a lot of deals that are in a one to $3 billion range of UPB. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that that's, if it's a one and done trade, it's a lot of time and effort by somebody, a buyer to execute that versus somebody who's a consistent seller. And so relationships matter. Um, you know, this industry in some ways has increasingly gone away from relationships, right? We best X everything to the nth degree. But in terms of the MSR market, and particularly bulk trades, relationships matter, strength of the counterparty matters, consistency of the seller matters, and performance matters. Um, and I think those are all factors they are having some buyers or some buyers take pause, some buyers be aggressive here, but not being consistently aggressive across all deals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one question, this one is to Olivia. On one of the slides that you presented, you showed the, uh, the, the cost to originate and with some increases by percentage in in various categories so what what is considered fulfillment versus operations was one question that came in yeah good question um so our fulfillment groupings that's just going to include your processing your underwriting and your closing 
departments. And then as we get into back office, that's where you're going to get into uh, post-closing, compliance, uh, your whole secondary team is going to be included in that back office. Um, and then also, obviously, any of your corporate job titles, as well as your entire benefits expense. So we're putting that whole benefits expense into uh, the back office grouping. So that's you know, where those bigger increases that you saw in the back office, that's a lot of where that's coming from. Yeah. Great. Then, then another one here, um, you know, this one could probably go over to you, Seth. Uh, you alluded to this also in your comments, and uh, one of the one of the audience members seized on the comment that you made about rates moving up so high so quickly, and um, you know, with coupons not typically kind of reaching that level or not at that level maybe currently. What 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 TVA hedge would typically be used in this kind of environment? Well, I mean, Mortgage, Mortgage News Daily had a nice little piece that they put out today on, um, you know, and this sounds funny, but don't track the 5% TVA because it's not liquid, but look at the four and the four and a halves because that's where the volume still is. That gets to be a little tricky here is if we start really printing six percent mortgages um but you know the 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 smart people in the room that do the capital market side of the house will say that the four and a half tba is probably still the coupon of choice people are are tentatively trying to move into fives but until there's adequate float in it you could really get whipsawed around. And the same thing occurs on an MSR hedge side as it occurs on the pipeline side, it's just the other side of the equation. But you always wanna make sure you're in a liquid coupon on that on that TVA side. I alluded to this, and, and again, there's folks that write articles about this every day and that are much smarter than I am on it. But the perception is that, and again, this perception might go away with the Fed movement today. It, might not, but the perception was that some of those mortgages that you may have created this week, depending on where rates kind of settle out, might be subject to um, uh, renegotiations. And so people are sort of unwilling to get too far into uh, what might be deemed an illiquid TBA coupon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, what what does your crystal ball tell you, Seth, in terms of in terms of where where interest rates are going to go? I mean, you talk about you know, reactions to the Fed's announcement. Um, you know whether that was in line with expectations. Probably was, but there were probably some corners of the market that were hoping for a hundred basis points to some stronger signal that they were going to get inflation under control more quickly. Um, you know, and, and I think you also mentioned the fact that there, maybe there's been a little bit of an overreaction here over the last uh, few months and, um, you know, causing the yield on the 10 year to run up maybe more than it, than it, than it should, uh, than it would, than it would model out to or something. And so what, I mean, what is, what's likely to, to happen here over the next little while? Well, for those that I met with in New York and MBA secondary, where I was talking about mortgage rates might be four and three quarters by the end of the year, that's starting to look like a really bad crystal ball. It's probably broken. Um, I, I still believe that I think mortgage rates. So the, the perception that I, I don't think the rate movement today, and again, people will be digesting the minutes, and I think Chairman Powell is actually speaking as we are as we are talking. Mortgage rates will will continue to rise or or not decline until the market perception is that the Fed has inflation under control. And I think when the Fed that when that perception occurs, whether or not it's real or not, I think that it will kind of be the peak of mortgage rates. Um, you know, a lot of forecasts have mortgage rates kind of settling out in the low fives by the end of the year. Um, I still think that's probable and possible. And by that, it, you know, if you think about that, that means everything sort of from this Monday to whenever that is, is certainly um, ripe for refinance activity. 
but uh, but uh, but the longer that the Fed is perceived to not have inflation under control, rates will continue to leak upward, and that becomes untenable at some point for the purchase side of the market. I mean, I know, I know that there's data that gets produced every day, but you know, in some cases, mortgage payments have doubled what they have over the last 60 days. That's going to have a significant increase. On, that's going to have a significant impact on the purchase side of the market, and and particularly people on both sides, right, willing to buy and sell. So, um, I, I think they've run too far too fast. But on the other hand, we have eight percent inflation, and that needs to get controlled. Until that's controlled, mortgage rates aren't coming down. I say this is the nicest way, but the Fed has a very strong incentive due to our debt in this country to keep long-term rates as low as they can for as long as they can. So I think they need to be aggressive on inflation. I think they're trying to navigate a very soft landing in the economy that's looking like it's very difficult to get there at this point. Yeah. Well, I'll maybe I'll maybe just end with some closing comments here. And I, you know, Seth, Olivia, you guys feel free to chime in and share some of your own, but as I said when we opened the webinar, it certainly is an interesting time in the mortgage industry. And uh, you look at the the graph that Olivia shared of production by quarter over the last several years. And what's interesting is that, as she pointed out in her comments, production in Q1 of 2022 was higher than it's ever been in any other Q1. And it's above the levels that we saw throughout 2019. And so, yeah, we're settling back down into something that's, that is probably more typical. What makes this particular cycle so challenging is that it's coming on the heels of, as you could see in that same graph, some, some incredibly high volume quarters there in 2020 and 2021. And so it's it's a case of the, the Fed giving and the Fed taking away, and it, it creates a massive whipsaw. And so, you know, I, I would just end by just, you know, with a public service announcement, I'm sure you've heard from everybody, you know, lots of times over the last several months, and that is now is it's as important as ever to be paying very close attention uh, to the business and really digging into the data and, and comparing yourself to peers, trying to get as efficient as possible, looking at ways to, uh, to right size the organization, making sure that you have the right level of staffing uh, to go back to the, the levels that were more typical of 2019, 18, because that's, that's probably where we're gonna settle because uh, those are kind of historical norms and what we saw over the last couple of years were not historical norms. Uh, and so pay attention to those and, and pour over data. If, we, if our team can be of assistance, um, you know, we have a lot of data available to us. Olivia and her team do great work for our clients and um, you know, we can leverage some of that data, leverage tools that we've developed for mortgage companies to help bring some more insight into your business to help you operate more efficiently. Um, anything, Seth or Olivia, you guys want to share as we wrap up? The, the, the only thing I would add is I, I kind of see three pillars out there, revenue, costs, and risks. We're hyper-focused on reducing cost. We're hyper-focused on trying to find additional revenue, but are you really hyper-focused on not taking unnecessary risks in this environment? And so I think you need to, I think, to some degree, risks is the third element of that long-term strategy that kind of gets thrown away right now. And, and being in a risk role to, through most of my career, understanding those risks is more important than ever, especially as revenues have come down and you're trying to control costs. And risks likely increase, right? Or, or no, I wouldn't even say likely, they do increase in environments like this, whether it's fraud, whether it's default risk, uh, repurchase risk because of the massive volumes that were done in 2020 and 2021 and the potential defects um, that made their way through the underwriting process. There are a lot of risks to the business and there was some significant volume done there for a couple of years. So 
Uh, that's very good advice. So pay attention to those risks very closely and uh, don't underestimate them. So with that, we're right at time here. And uh, again, just want to thank Seth and Olivia for the time they put in uh, to preparing for this and for the data and information that they shared with us. Really appreciate their insight and comments. Thank you all for joining today. Um, it, you know, as I said in the beginning, you know, taking any time away from the business right now to uh, to join, participate in something like this is a lot to ask. So we appreciate you doing that, spending some time with us today. Uh, again, uh, we will send out the recording here in the next couple of days so you get the recording in the slide deck. And if there are any other questions that anybody has uh, after you log off today, don't hesitate to uh, send an email to uh, any of the three of us here. We'll make sure that we get your question answered. So. Again, thank you all for your time today. Great, great to be with you and uh, enjoy the rest of your day and we'll talk soon. Yeah, also, thanks.